What's up everybody? I hope you're doing well. So I had so much fun doing a reaction video to The Therapist in Never Have I Ever that I thought it would be fun to do another one of these reaction videos. And for today, I'm gonna be reacting to The Therapist from the HBO series In Treatment. If you're not familiar with the show In Treatment, it ran for three seasons starting in 2008 and it features a psychologist whose character is named Dr. Paul Weston, played by Gabriel Byrne. And every single episode of the series is one therapy session. Now each episode is about 30 minutes long and I think it's supposed to depict like a 50 minute therapy session. So HBO used some TV voodoo magic to fit 50 minutes into 30, very impressive. And you can still watch In Treatment if you have a subscription to HBO Max. So in today's video, we're gonna react to two of my favorite episodes from season one, episode five and episode eight. So uh, let's dive into it. Welcome to Private Practice Skills. I'm Dr. Marie Fang, psychologist in private practice. I post videos offering tools I learned the hard way about starting and growing private practice so that you don't have to. And sometimes I make fun videos like this one because we all need a break. It's like, you know, it's like um back in school when it was like a Friday before a holiday break and the teacher just kind of just put a movie on and called it educational. It's kind of like that. That's what we're doing today. I first discovered the show In Treatment around 2013. I was a postdoc intern and as part of our consultation group, we would sometimes watch an episode and then sort of critique the psychologist's therapeutic techniques in the, the movie, which is super fun. Anyway, and then I discovered that they had it available at my library, and so I watched all of the episodes of In Treatment that I could find through my library because I was a broke postdoc and I didn't have HBO. But now I have HBO Max and we can go back and watch it again. So I haven't watched this since 2013, but these two episodes, episodes five and eight, just really stand out in my memory from that time. And so we're gonna go back and revisit them. So let's first take a look at season one, episode eight, where Paul is meeting with this teenage client named Sophie for their second session together. Now she started coming into therapy because she got into an accident while riding her bike and she was hit by a car but there's some suspicion about whether it was truly an accident or not, or if maybe she intentionally meant to hit the car. I don't really remember what happens in this episode, but I remember there were some shutter-worthy boundary crossings, so let's see what comes of it. Previously on In Treatment. I really don't remember what happened. I was on my bicycle and a car ran into me and- What did they tell you afterwards? That I flew my bike right into the street. They told me that I needed the opinion of a psychiatrist because the insurance company of the car that hit me has a problem with my injuries. How do you get on with your dad? He's the only person in this world who truly loves me. The only one except Sai. Who's Sai? This is Sai. He's my coach. Hello? Sophie. Hello. Are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'll get you some dry clothes. I'm fine. Really? Are you sure you wouldn't be more comfortable if... No. Wait a sec. Here we go. Are they your daughters? Mm-hmm. Well, did you ask her if it was okay? No, but I'm sure she won't mind. I'll put yours in the, uh, in the dryer and they'll be ready by the end of the session. It's worth noting that Dr. Paul's office is connected to his home, which uh, is already a tricky thing in and of itself. I personally wouldn't feel comfortable doing that, but I know some therapists do do that. And so he was able to just hop into his house, take some clothes from his daughter's room that are dry and offer them to his client, which is so lovely and kind of fatherly and probably something that this client would find really helpful, it seems like but also there's just some kind of sticky boundary stuff going on here too. It kind of gives me a little bit of like, ooh, this is a lot of overlap with his personal life and she knows that he has a daughter maybe around her age. Uh, mm, it just, it's a little, mm, it's a little, it's a little slippery. Let's see. Well, you'll have to help me. I haven't gotten dressed on my own since my accident. Did you ever hear of an umbrella, kiddo? My goodness. Sweetheart, look at you. You just 
just all skin and bones, aren't you? Okay, I will have these dry for you before you leave. How on earth do you manage with two broken arms? I don't. Okay, if you didn't catch what just happened, basically this client, the teenage client Sophie, went into the psychologist's house and the psychologist's wife, I think her name is Kate, helped this client undress, which again, I feel the both and it would have been so inappropriate for the male psychologist to help his 16 year old client undress. But on the other hand, it's very caring to offer dry clothes to his, you know, probably freezing cold, wet client. But under no circumstances would I invite my client into my personal home space to meet one of my personal family members and then to have my family member help that client get undressed. And the layers on top of that, since she's a minor, they potentially want to have parental guardian permission to do that. But even then, I wouldn't even... Ugh. What would I do if I were actually in this situation, though? Uh, I probably, I would just probably give a teen client the option of either staying in their wet clothes, given that, you know, she can't change herself because of the casts, um, or the option that I could contact her guardian if she wanted to be picked up. That's probably, I, yeah, that's what I would do. But I get the sentiment of what's going on here. This show does a really great job of kind of creating scenarios like this, where as a therapist, you kind of go, huh, what would I do in that situation? Because yeah, you're sopping wet teenage client. You're not gonna just say, sorry, buck up. So. Did you write my evaluation? No. Why didn't you? That's why I'm here. That's all I need from you. That stupid evaluation. Actually, I don't think I know you quite well enough yet, Sophie. And I tried to write it with my mom, and that didn't work, obviously. We got in a fight, and I was like, I so don't need this right now. So I left. I went to this apartment near the gym where the foreign girls stay. I told them that my parents were going out of town, so they let me crush there. Sophie. Before you arrived, I, um, I got a phone call and um, I heard you asking somebody to let you out of the car. I thought I hung up before the call went through. Was that your father? You could have hung up, you know. Or do you always eavesdrop on other people's conversations? So if you're my patient, I'd ask you if you thought it was a coincidence that I overheard that conversation. But I'm not your patient. I wouldn't see a therapist who I thought was an eavesdropper. I'd be out of here. So did your dad bring you? I told you, I had a fight with him. I thought you said you had a fight with your mom. It's really none of your business who I came here with. This therapist, Dr. Paul, has a very hands-off, slow-to-intervene approach, which is kind of intriguing. I definitely would speak more often and much sooner than he tends to, but I like how this therapist is portrayed as just keeping a lot of silent space and the way they've scripted the show, at least, that always ends up bringing out some really interesting information from his clients. And whenever he does intervene, that he tends to be very straightforward and heavy hitting. And I think we might see some of that later in this episode. Your daughter's clothes are gross. <laughs> why is that funny? But why are they gross? They're hideous. Okay. I'm really not getting my evaluation today, am I? This is stupid. You people are such tools. I can't believe you get paid for this. It's a reasonable statement. This guy has been really hands off with this girl. And I think if I were in his shoes, I would be saying a lot more things. So her reaction makes sense to me, but I, I imagine he's also, I assume he's also assessing her and how she responds to his silence, maybe. Sounds like um, you and Sai are, uh... You're very close. No. Why? Can you tell that over the phone? You said he wanted to take you to camp. 
despite the fact that you had an injury and didn't he didn't he drive you here? He was on his way. He wants me to come to the camp to at least watch the training so I don't lose focus. But no, he couldn't make them pay for Darlene either. Darlene? Besides wife. She has to pay her own way and Dana's too. Dana's the little girl you used to babysit. What, why did you stop? Who told you I stopped? Did I tell you that last week? You have a good memory for an old fart. <laughs> It is true that somehow we just remembered like the seemingly smallest details about our clients and then our clients are always just so amazed, but it's like built into the therapist DNA, you just remember. So why did you stop? They didn't need me anymore. Did you work there for, uh, for a long time? No. Sort of. And uh, Dana must have become very fond of you. Did she become attached to you? Yeah. She's the cutest. They told her that I wouldn't be able to babysit her anymore because I'd had this accident. But see, I'd already told her before that I couldn't keep living with them once her mom came home. I wanted to prepare her, you know? Mm. But they didn't tell me what they were telling her, so the whole lie became mixed up in her head. You said that when Darlene came home, you knew you couldn't keep on living there. I never said I lived there. But you told Dana you wouldn't be able to go on living there. Yeah, because she's a child. But so it felt to her like I lived there. So the psychologist is very quickly sniffing out a lie, which I feel like, especially with teenagers, we're often just uh, having to be investigators a little bit. But he's finding a way to do it in a way that's very therapeutic still. Very calm, not blaming, just sort of like, oh, I'm confused. Hmm. What the hell is going on here? What, what do you mean what the hell is going on here? My dad was right. I'll go to therapy and I'll end up a psycho. Just like your daughter. Everyone thinks she's a freak. Are you trying to hurt me, Sophie? No, but you should know what people say about her. She had this thing with this guy. And afterwards, everyone said she'd turn out psycho because her dad is a shrink. Shrinks kids are psycho. Everyone knows that. Maybe that's because, because some people are afraid of therapy. I must have forgotten some key detail from his first session with Sophie because it's clear now that Sophie knows his daughter. <laughs> Maybe they go to the same school or something like that, but I am suddenly far more alarmed about the dual relationship going on between this therapist and this teenage client, I mean, unless you're in like a super small town, which I am doubtful that that's the case here. I'll have to go and double check what town they're in and flash it on the screen somewhere. But unless they're in a super small rural town where everyone goes to the same school, I really don't think it would be a good idea to see a teenage client who goes to the same school as your teenage child. That's especially if you know that they go to the same school. Ooh. Okay, let's see what happens. I think there are things that Perhaps you feel deep inside, Sophie, that you'd like to talk about? I'm fine. You want to worry about a little girl? Worry about your own kid. Does it bother you that people talk about my daughter? Why would it bother me? Because maybe you know what it feels like. Maybe I don't. Well, we were talking about your coach, and then suddenly you brought up the story of my daughter. I just... Yeah, because I thought you should know. Are there people who say things about you, Sophie? At the gym? Maybe. All right, he's starting to kick it up now. Not so silent anymore and starting to call out this girl's crap because he's pretty spot on. Rather than getting defensive about his daughter, which would be the very human reaction to do in response to somebody saying what she was saying about his daughter, he's able to keep his therapist hat on straight and see what's going on clearly for this client. And again, therapeutically, gently, but clearly call her out. But Sophie, I get the feeling that you're afraid to tell me something that other people say about you. Are my clothes dry yet? Can you go check? I won't be getting an evaluation today. I'd at least like dry clothes. Well, I have started to write it. Well, can I see what you've got? I'm, uh, I'm not quite finished yet. But you haven't written a word. 
He's gonna show her. Though would you really write it on a legal pad, it would be on a computer. I had a 2008, I don't know, maybe. During first session, appears to be very impressive. Sensitive, mature for her age, very intelligent, and a highly independent personality. I love that he went and got the evaluation so far and, and basically used that as a trust building moment because not only had he started the evaluation after all, but what he had to say about her, I'm sure felt very kind. Do you really think those things you wrote? Absolutely. You know, this morning I tried to brush my teeth like you. Like me? Mm-hmm. Like... How'd it go? I couldn't do it. I just stick it in there. Why'd you try that? Because I wanted to know how it feels. How did it feel? I felt useless. Like, demeaned or something. I love that intervention. Whether it was true or not that he actually tried it with the toothbrush, um, he's clearly shifted his strategy. He went from kind of blank slate, doesn't say much, shrink dude, to uh, actively building trust with his client. He's showing proof of what he's saying. He's sharing how he empathizes with her without making her have to talk about it directly. So clearly finding uh, kind of unconventional avenues to build that trust. Good job. Good job, HBO writers. You know, when you walked in here, I thought to myself, somebody in your life has broken the rules. And I felt that if I had helped you change your clothes, that I would have been doing the same thing. I felt like you were testing me. I felt like you wanted to make sure that this was a safe place that the same things that happen out there don't happen in here. He's finding a very loving and caring way to call her out and basically call out that somebody is uh, harming her. Your time's up. I'll go get your clothes. Okay. Well, this is an interesting session. I mean, he clearly built up trust with his client here, but also there's some mysteries about what's going on. Clearly I can't show the entire episode in here, so you'll have to watch it for yourself if you wanna see what happened in full. Let's see this last little bit. All right, you, arms way up, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um. We have all kinds of weird boundary crossings here that give me the heebie-jeebies and I would be trying to avoid at all costs, but at the same time, it was also clearly important for this client and she needed that hug. And there you have it, season one, episode eight of In Treatment. Oh my goodness. I remember why I love this show so much when I watched it the first time because though on the one hand, uh, it's very cringeworthy and gets into all kinds of weird kind of boundary type issues. The story is written in such a way where even as a trained therapist, you watch and go, oh, but I understand why the therapist made that choice. I understand why Paul decided to offer his daughter's clothes. And maybe that's not what I would have done, but uh, he doesn't seem totally wacko for having done that even though it's just such a vast boundary crossing to have this girl come in his home put on his daughter's clothes his wife is undressing her and all of that so if you want to see what happens you'll just have to check out the rest of the season where you can follow the storyline with this girl sophie as well okay let's keep it going we're going to open a new episode and next we're going to watch episode five from season one and the reason why I wanted to highlight this episode is because in addition to Paul's usual therapy sessions that we get to watch, like the one we just saw, he also starts meeting with an old supervisor therapist person. Uh, it's not super clear what the nature of their relationship is. 
when you're starting to watch them interact. And episode five is the first time you get to see him interact with his old supervisor. Uh, and I just remember feeling some cringeworthy moments when I watched it the first time, even though I can't quite remember the content of it. So let's go back and see what happens. Hello, Gina. Hello, Paul. Again, it appears that we're meeting in someone's home office. Mm, it's a former supervisor with the kiss on the cheek. I don't know. I <laughs> It's already just amping up the little boundary cringes for me. Let's see what happens. And it's like nighttime. I don't know. It just feels a little intimate. That's where I sit. Oh, yes, of course. I love how, though, on one level, therapists uh, tend to be, you know, gentle and therapeutic. But sometimes we can be really blunt about stuff. <laughs> and so I love how she just says, like, that's where I sit. Stating the obvious in a very assertive, clear manner. Good therapeutic skill. You look very well, Gina. Thank you. Okay, that's not how people talk to each other, right? You're seeing your supervisor for the first time in a really, really long time and be like, oh my goodness, it's so good to see you. What are your, how have you been? They just kind of chuckle silently with each other for a while. It's like, mmm. That's not really how people act. But you know, maybe that's just kind of how the world thinks therapists interact together. I don't know. Do you guys interact with other therapists like that? I don't. Um, Gina, I, I, uh, I called you last night because um, I really felt that I needed to talk to somebody. It's, um, actually it's something that's been bothering me a lot lately but uh, only yesterday i really felt the need that i had to to talk about it i i feel that pff, i don't know how to put this but i feel like i'm i'm just losing my patience I, I, i'm losing my patience with my patience i remember you said once that one of our biggest problems was that we don't have an audience we don't have anybody to pat us on the back to to approve of what we're doing somebody that you can go to and say, did you see how I maneuvered that person into that situation? Did you see how I got him to say what I wanted him to? What I meant was, is that we have no one to criticize us, no one to review us. What I like about this, I don't know if this is a supervision session or a therapy session, they don't really tell us what this relationship is, but we're really seeing that this therapist has some serious mounting issues coming up that he has probably been needing some help and support for a long time and he's been coping with his need for help by working more seeing more clients oh goodness so if you're relating with this guy as uh you're reflecting on your own therapeutic work taking on more clients to prove yourself or whatever it is maybe just uh take a moment take a step back and evaluate if you maybe could use a little break a little support, a little therapy, maybe from someone with better boundaries than, than this lady. I got your back. I must admit that I thought something was going on at home when you called. At home? Why? Oh, because it's been almost 10 years since I last heard from you. The last time you were here, you were so angry. You didn't even come to the funeral. I thought, how angry he must be. He didn't even come to David's funeral. I'm really sorry about that, Gina. I was gonna come, but I felt that it was, I felt it was inappropriate. Then you call me out of the blue? Yes, because I needed somebody to talk to. You were the one who chose to stop having a supervisor. You said I interfered with your practice, that instead of guiding, I was interfering. Yes, I said that. But then there are times when a supervisor has to take a stand. In your case, I felt I had to take a stand. I had to interfere. But that's not the way I feel now. I mean, that's ancient history. Why do we have to go there? Okay, so we just got clarity. This is a supervisor, which uh, their interaction together right now is weirdly between supervision and therapy. Clearly, they have a personal relationship together. It's not therapy, but they're doing some weird therapy stuff in there. 
Anyway, and it's been like 10 years-ish since he left off with a supervisor. Whatever happened, he left in anger. I, I can't imagine, you know, having that kind of interaction with anyone, let alone your supervisor, and then 10 years later calling up, asking to meet without even acknowledging that that happened. And especially since it sounds like they were really connected and he didn't show up to her husband's funeral. Mm. It's a messy. Kate and I, we, we just argue nonstop. I think it's beginning to affect my work. What do you mean you argue? Well, it's always about something insignificant, something trivial that triggers it off. This time it was about Max. She knows how I feel about this. I have said it over and over again. I am against the idea of it. What does she do? Behind my back, she takes Max to this, to this class without telling me. Okay, I'm cringing here because the, the part that's tricky for me as I'm watching this is trying to peg what kind of relationship these two have together. Is she his therapist? No. She's his supervisor. She was, but they ended on a sour note, never reconciled. Ten years passes. He shows up out of the blue and he's talking to her kind of like she's his therapist. Uh, but they also know each other on a very, per very, very personal level. And so... <laughs> Is it therapy? Is it supervision? Is it friendship? It's very, very blurry. And just as boundaries are so important when it comes to the, the client therapist relationship, boundaries are also very important when it comes to the supervision re uh, relationship. And I haven't had the privilege of supervising anyone at this point, but I know having experienced being a supervisee that if the, the supervisor starts to hear about some pretty significant personal items coming up, that would be a really great time to refer the supervisee to their own personal therapist. So this is a really messy relationship with, with this lady and the fact that th this guy has been very unclear about what he's after in meeting with her, but clearly he's struggling and really needs some help. She says, I, I don't love her. <laughs> that I, uh, I'm always trying to be a step ahead of her, that I handle her like a, like a patient. She's right, isn't she? But I can't help but see it from a perspective. And all I can see is... All I can see is rupture. What do you mean, rupture? Are you trying to shrink me, Gina? <laughs> and yet you were here for eight years. Yes, what does that mean? You were under my counseling. Eight years I took care of you. You find that difficult to accept? Get very confusing. Was she his therapist or supervisor? I'm so confused. But it is interesting where he says, are you trying to shrink me, Gina? I'm thinking, what would... I don't know what you want from her. What do you want from her? But some of the content he's talking about does really happen for therapists, especially therapists who are overworked and overplace their identity in their work. This feeling that you feel really separated from your own personal life. And um, even though maybe you're an awesome therapist to your clients on many levels, you're not such a great, you know, spouse, parent, child, friend, etc., because you've kind of learned to distance yourself from reality as a way to cope and overly put your identity in your work. So <laughs> If you can relate to some of the stuff you just said, again, might I advise you some personal therapy with a real therapist and not a former supervisor miscellaneous person and uh, and maybe, you know, slowing down, pushing the brakes on, on taking on a lot of new clients and such for the moment. Oh my goodness. And clearly when she speaks to him, she's talking as though she's his therapist, but then they have this personal banter that comes in and interrupts us. This is exactly why we try to avoid dual relationships that have the potential to harm. And if you've been someone's supervisor, you should not become their therapist. And if you've been someone's supervisor, you probably don't want to dip into friendship and then supervisor. It, it, it's just getting a little, my little therapist alarms are going off. Like something's weird about this relationship. Well, we're going to keep it paused there for now.
and this is probably a long video anyway, so it's a good place to bring it to a close. I hope you had fun following along with me as I got to react to a couple of the episodes from In Treatment. And actually, just today I found out as I was doing some Googling about this show that after a 10-year hiatus, the show is actually going to release a fourth season. It ran for three seasons, like starting in 2008, hasn't been on, and it's going to release another season in 2021. I don't know the exact start date. If I can find it somewhere, I'll flash it on the screen. So if you're interested in getting into a new binge watching type show, this is a fun one. It's great entertainment with lots of weird boundary crossings, but also some legit kind of therapeutic stuff going on. So it's really fun to watch as a therapist. Um, so you can watch out for that. It's coming on HBO. You can catch it on HBO Max as well. I well, hope you enjoyed following along with this as much as I did. Before we close, I'd like to say thank you to therapynotes.com for sponsoring this video. If you are a therapist in private practice, Therapy Notes can help you with all of your practice management needs, from scheduling to notes to billing to a HIPAA secure telehealth platform. If you're interested in checking it out, you can get two months to try it for free with no commitment just by clicking the link in the description of this video. Well, if you're interested in seeing more more videos like this one where I get to react to various therapists and media, leave a comment and let me know what other types of shows or movies you'd like to see me react to. And I'm so excited to make more videos like this one. And until next time, from one therapist to another, I wish you well. If you're not familiar with the show, it ran for three seasons, start three. That's a three.